I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network as ever. I'm your host, Harry Simiu, and on this edition of the show, we're going to be looking back on Arsenal's 3-1 win over Chelsea at Emirates Stadium. You know what, Manchester City, we might not have it in our hands anymore. You might be in control. You might be uh, the ones with it to lose, basically. But Arsenal are not going to go away that easily. Um, And that's what I took away from last night's game. And and I was delighted to see the Gunners turn in a strong performance, at least for about 60, 65 minutes. Um, And then, of course, make sure that they got over the line in what remained of the game. And, of course, return to the Premier League uh, summit, albeit temporarily. So, um, yeah, we're going to break it all down. We're going to discuss the team selection. We're going to be discussing some of the feelings pre-game, uh, how I'm feeling post-game. We'll be talking Jakub Kivio, Martin Odegaard, Granit Xhaka, Jorginho as well, who starred in midfield for Mikel Arteta's side. The injury concern regarding Gabriel and um, and how best to cope with uh, Manchester City's game uh, tonight, which of course takes place against West Ham United. Um Big hello to everybody who's watching this or who's listening to this. Uh, Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Hope you've um, had a good week so far. Uh, It is a short week. Bank holiday uh, means that. And we've got another one coming up this weekend. So make sure you enjoy that time. The weather is starting to get that little bit better. That's certainly improved my mood. Uh, But also Arsenal finally getting back to winning ways has done done a hell of a trick there as well. Um, Let's kick off with sort of... The pre-match, how was I feeling sort of going into the game? I must admit I was a little bit nervous. Um, I felt like there was a nervousness and an anxiety almost in the air at Emirates Stadium last night. It was as though, you know, people were feeling just a little bit deflated based on what had happened in, of course, the last few weeks. Not only with regards to the men's team, not only with regards to obviously the points that we dropped prior and then the draw, uh, the defeat, I beg your pardon, that we suffered at the hands of Manchester City. But you think about the FA Youth Cup final, which took place last week and how disappointing that was from an Arsenal perspective. So you're on a real high and all of a sudden you hit a low. Then you had the Women's Champions League final on Monday. Um, valiant effort from the ladies. They, they gave it absolutely everything. Injuries killed them in the end, if you ask me, and, and have caused them so many issues this season. They fought right until the death, but a tired mistake ended up costing them in front of a 60,000 crowd at Emirates Stadium. And again, in terms of the club, I think the feeling felt a little bit low and a little bit flat. So it was really, really important that Mikel Arteta's side went out there last night and put in not just or not just got the three points, but put in a performance as well, a performance that reminded people of how good this Arsenal side are of how far they've come over the course of the last 12, 18 months and why, despite the fact that we're not in control of the title race anymore, we've still had a really good and enjoyable season. And Mikel Arteta has talked a lot about that, hasn't he, in recent interviews, in press conferences, about the need to enjoy the ride, about the need to embrace the fact that we are where we are and not allow it to kind of be a burden on us, which, you know, it it gets to that point because you're so nervous and you're desperate to win. And, you know, having got this far, you, you can't, really sort of fathom the idea of losing it and and ending up empty-handed at the end of the season. But whatever happens between now and the end of the season, we will not end up empty-handed because we've got our place back in the Champions League after a long, long time. This club, this great, huge football club has been out of the Champions League for far too long. And now we're back in that. And all I said that I wanted to see and all I'm expecting now is for Arsenal to make a fight of it. Now, that's not to say... I expect us to go to St. James's Park and blow them away on Sunday. They're a very, very good side. But I want to see effort. I want to see Arsenal playing their game. I want to see Arsenal playing with the shackles off. Because we all know from recent history that Arsenal are a much better side when that pressure is relieved slightly. And when they're not necessarily expected to to go out there and, and sort of win every single game in their path. They've handled that pressure incredibly well. Um, throughout most of the season. But I'd argue that up until around Christmas, up until the World Cup and slightly beyond that, you know, there wasn't really a pressure because people were constantly talking about the Arsenal drop-off. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. But when we got right to the business end 
um, we did start to feel it. There's no question about that. Injuries have been a problem as well. We know that. We've talked about that a lot on this podcast. Um, but for me, the pressure has been probably a bigger factor because even with a couple of key players missing at times, we've still not played anywhere near our game and anywhere near the level that we know we can. So, yeah, there will be a disappointment. And I certainly feel that. And I, I felt that going into yesterday's game. But what I will say is the performance, the fact that it was over a London rival, the fact that we made such light work of Chelsea, who, of course, have been poor all season. But the fact that we were able to really stick the boot in on Frank Lampard's side, for me, made me feel that little bit better anyway. And as I said, showed me that Arsenal aren't going to go away that easily. And if Manchester City are going to win this Premier League, which they probably will, they're going to need to go out there and they're going to need to get enough points on the board. And they're going to need to make sure that they're not making too many mistakes because hopefully uh, we'll be right there behind them waiting to pounce if indeed that opportunity presents itself. Talking about the team selection from Mikel Arteta, well, I contemplated the idea of, of him maybe making changes going into this game. Or if you remember on the preview show, we discussed it at length. We said, well, if he didn't change it against Manchester City, if he didn't change the style away at the Etihad, which is no doubt the most difficult place to go in this Premier Division, then why would he do that against a Chelsea side that are struggling? So I have to say, I was surprised to see him make three changes to the starting eleven, Wasn't surprised to see Leandro Trossard come in. I thought maybe he'd have come in for Bukayo Saka. I, sh I should have known better. Mikel Arteta very rarely leaves Bukayo Saka out unless he has to. He's a real key part of his plans. And, and you know, whenever he's fit, he plays. It's as simple as that. So I wasn't shocked by Trossard coming in. Maybe a little bit surprised that Martinelli was the one to drop out because he's been brilliant of late. Um, Arsenal's leading goal scorer in the Premier League going into last night's game. You know, he's had a wonderful, wonderful season. I was surprised at the decision to take out Thomas Partey. Um, I mentioned it on the preview show. I said that with Chelsea's midfield, which last night was uh, Kovacic, Enzo Fernandez, and N'Golo Kante, I said that I worried about Jorginho's lack of mobility. I worried about the fact that we do like to play high up. We do like to squeeze teams. And sometimes the gap between the lines can, can get a little bit bigger if you don't have the right centre-backs and if you don't squeeze up at the right times. That player playing in that six role for Arsenal has a lot of ground to cover, needs to be able to go left and right, even more so without William Saliba in the side. And so I wondered if that was going to be a problem. But I was wrong. I take my hat off to Jorginho. Maybe he felt that he had a bit of a point to prove against his former club. Maybe he felt like uh, this was an opportunity to go and show Chelsea what they're missing and, and that they were wrong given their current plight to sort of banish him from the team and have him play in such a bit part role and, and, and thinking that it was OK and acceptable and that he was dispensable enough to move on to a rival. Um, obviously, we're not rivals now because we, we're punching at the top of the league in their level on points with Bournemouth, but you get the drift um, of what I'm trying to say. So I was surprised by that one. Um, we'll come on to talk about his performance in a little bit. And I was surprised at the Rob Holding thing. Now, Mikel Arteta, when asked why he made the change uh, at centre-back, said we were simply conceding too many goals. And he's bang on. Um, you know, we've, we've been conceding way too many goals for way too long now. We go all the way back to... Um, you know, even the Bournemouth game, you know, conceding goals at home, silly, sloppy goals. You look at the Southampton game, we conceded three at home against a side that a rock bottom of the Premier League. If you think about the trip to Anfield, OK, you can concede a couple at Anfield and it not be a disgrace. But the two we conceded uh, at West Ham and, you know, it, 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 he was right. There was way too many goals going in. We were shipping way too many and I guess that gave him the opportunity to justify making that change. Not that he needs to as manager, but, you know, in his own head, he'd, be, he'd have been looking at the team over the last few weeks and thinking, well, hold on a minute. You know, we're scoring goals. That hasn't really been the problem. The problem's been at the other end. What can I change? What can I do to try and fix this? And, you know, some people have sort of been really, really critical of Rob Holding, myself included. Others have defended him, have said, well, what other option do we have? And the decision to bring Jakob Kivior in was one that I don't think Arteta could ever really win from because if he put Jakob Kivior in last night and he performed to a good level, which he did, albeit against pretty poor opposition on the night, then people would say, well, hold on, Mikel, why didn't you do that before? 
if he came in and he was poor, uh, then people would have said, why did you change it? You know, there was a lot riding on last night. Now, I know we're not in control when it comes to the title racing anymore. And I know it's not in our own hands anymore. But if we didn't win last night, you'd have said that the dream was over. And every week that we can keep the dream alive is obviously a bonus and a positive, And it gives us something to look forward to and something to uh, be hopeful for uh, going from week to week. So the decision to bring in Kivior was one that maybe came too late, you could argue. But at the same time, hindsight is an easy thing to kind of uh, look back with. And, and it's, it's very easy to be critical of people's decisions after you've seen the end result. And I have to say, and I've got to be completely honest, that I wouldn't have risked Jakob Kivior at Anfield. I wouldn't have risked him at West Ham. And I wouldn't have played him at Manchester City based on what I knew about him previously. And I'm not blaming my own trumpet, but I did probably or do probably know a little bit more about him than your average Arsenal fan because of my sort of affiliation with Serie A, how much I love it, how much work I do on it. So I did know a little bit about him and, and I felt like he was still a bit of an unknown quantity. And I thought that it was an almighty gamble to throw him in. So I'm not going to be revisionist and sit here and say, Mikel Arteta cost us the Premier League title by not bringing Kivior in earlier, as I've seen some people, because you also have to factor in how bad Chelsea were. And they were dreadful. They were really, really poor. I mean, Frank Lampard, just people sort of make jokes about him and call him a vibes manager in that there is no tactical now. There is no real plan. There is no intelligence really to a lot of the things he does. It is about spirit, passion, all of those things um, that only get you so far. And, you know, I know Chelsea haven't scored goals and I know they've struggled in front of goal. And I understand why he looked at his forward line and thought I needed to make some changes. And, you know, what can I do here? And he maybe thought, maybe hoped that Aubameyang's vibes against a, a side that let him go in the way that Arsenal did against the manager who clearly fell out with him and felt that it was time to move him on. I think maybe Frank Lampard thought that that would give Aubameyang a fighting chance of impact in the game. But I think he was very quickly reminded of why Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang hadn't started a Premier League game for Chelsea since November 6th when we played them at Stamford Bridge earlier on in the season. He was totally ineffective that day and he was totally ineffective last night. Now, you've got to give Arsenal's centre-half some credit for that obviously. But just looking at Aubameyang, he's a shadow of the player that he once was. He doesn't have that half a yard of pace anymore. Uh, there was a couple of times where balls were pinged into him and he couldn't bring it under control. I think I read that he had nine touches in total on the night, four of which were from kicking off, uh, which shows you that he was really, really, um, you know, really, really sort of... Um, ineffective in a game against his former club and in a game that Frank Lampard was kind of banking on him to have a bit of a reaction. He was booed by the Arsenal fans. He was um, heavily criticised when he left the club by a lot of us, rightly so in my opinion. And um, you felt like maybe with a point to prove he might come there and cause us problems. And It was one of those stories, one of those scripts that you often see in football come to fruition. I was worried about that pre-game. We spoke about it on the London Sports Show. Uh, we were worried about the fact that Aubameyang could be up for it tonight. This could be the game that clicks him back into gear, probably too late in terms of his overall Chelsea career. But yeah, um, I did wonder about that. And thankfully for us, he, he did nothing. So Arsenal, of course, uh, broke the deadlock through uh, Martin Odegaard. Um, but before we get to the kind of goals and, and all the rest of it, which is obviously the nice things to talk about. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the atmosphere for those that weren't in attendance last night. Well, I talked about the nervousness that there probably was hanging around the place before the game, the way I was feeling on a personal level. This was, and I spoke to, to John Murray on Five Live after the match. Some of you caught that and, and sent me some, some messages. So thank you for that. You can catch up with that on the uh, the Football Daily podcast, the BBC's Football Daily podcast. And one of the things that John Murray said was that this was the first time he'd been at the Emirates this season and he didn't feel that buzz arriving. He didn't feel that buzz inside the place before the game. But credit, absolute credit um, to those, uh, those that were in attendance because they made the atmosphere raucous. They got behind the team. They gave that passion. They gave that energy. They transmitted it, as Mikel Arteta likes to say, across onto the players. And I thought that really 
had a positive impact on the energy with which we played. Um, I think the changes in the team impacted on the energy as well and, and just sort of freshened things up a little bit. Sometimes in football, things can go a little bit stale. Uh, but the atmosphere, I thought, was really, really positive from the off. And I thought that was a big, big help to the Arsenal players. Now, it took the Gunners 18 minutes to break the deadlock. Martin Odegaard uh, scoring from a wonderful cutback from Granit Xhaka, who we've talked about all season. His willingness to sort of make those runs forward, to get into the penalty area, to get around the penalty area, to occupy the left wing position when Leandro Trossard was opting to go sort of walkabouts, going left, right. Um, you know, it's amazing because not only does he do that at the moment, Granit Xhaka, when he's fully fit and he's firing, he manages to get back and support as well. And he protected Jorginho, I think, quite well when he needed to, but also was able to get up and down and get into those areas and impact the game a lot in the final third. He was involved in the third goal as well. Um, and I thought he probably should have scored himself in the second half. So a lot of our attacking play came through Granit Xhaka. And that's good because a lot of the time we look at Martin Odegaard and we say, well, we like to funnel everything through him. We like to work things out to that right-hand side, Odegaard in the half space. And then we like to use Saka. And then we like to use White on the overlap. And maybe we don't do that enough on the other side. But to have Xhaka on the other side, giving you something different uh, to what Odegaard gives you on the right in terms of just being that little bit more direct um, and, and sort of being more mindful of his defensive responsibilities. But that means that Martinelli, because of his defensive responsibilities, or, or Trossard in, in last night's instance, um, can push that a little bit higher up because Xhaka is more aware of what he's got going on behind him. Zinchenko's inverted position as well just means that there is a totally different dynamic on the left-hand side. And it's good to be able to mix it up when you're building up so as not to become predictable and so as to be able to hurt uh, opposition teams. But that assist from Granit Xhaka for the first goal is wonderful because he gets the ball on that left-hand side and you're thinking, well, he's just going to put this into the box. And as good as Gabriel Jesus was last night, because I thought he was really good, I thought he went under the radar a little bit in terms of the post-match analysis. But I just thought when Granit Xhaka got that ball, he's just going to put this into the penalty area and it's going to get eaten up by the combination of Fafana and Thiago Silva. So what does he do? He looks up and he goes to pick someone out. But not only does he attempt to pick someone out on the edge of the box, somebody that he knows is going to be there because that's been drilled into this team. That's the level of coaching we're talking about. People understanding what each other are going to do before they've even done it. People being on the same wavelength is so, so important. And so not only does he spot the space, not only does he know that Martin Odegaard is going to come into that space, but he also recognises that actually to get that ball through to Martin Odegaard, he probably needs to put a bit of zip on it. He needs to ping it through the gap uh, so as it not to be intercepted. And he does exactly that. The pass is perfect. The finish from Odegaard is fantastic. First time, very easy to sky those, very easy to get underneath it, very easy to be slightly leaning back as you approach the ball and putting it over the top of the bar. But he keeps it controlled. He uses the power on the pinged pass from Granit Xhaka because Odegaard strikes that with his instep. And it isn't right in the corner. And I've seen some Chelsea fans suggesting that maybe Kepa Aretha Balaga could have done a little bit more um, to keep it out. But I just think the power beats him. I really, really do. And it comes off the bottom of the crossbar uh, and, and bounces into the back of the net, which is always aesthetically pleasing, isn't it? So, yeah, um, wonderful opening goal. And from then on, it, you knew there was only one winner. The crowd were up for it even more so than they were from the beginning. Um, everything just went up a couple of notches and Arsenal were really at it. And, and Chelsea, you could see that they're lacking in confidence. You could see that they... You know, they're, they're not able right now to deal with setbacks. You could see that it was boys against men in a, in a weird way. And, you know, we'd seen it boys against men at Manchester City just, just last week. So it was it would have been easy for Arsenal to kind of, you know, have that complex going into the game. Because as I keep saying and as I kept saying in the build up, yes, Chelsea have had a bad season, but they still have world class players or at least top players in that team and in that squad. I mean, that midfield on paper, very, very exciting. Aubameyang up front with Sterling and Madweke. Madweke, who I thought was probably Chelsea's best player, by the way, on either side is still very, very strong. You know, you think about the backline for Fana, 
Um, good player, signed for a lot of money from Leicester City. I've been impressed with him overall. Thiago Silva, very, very good player. Cesar Azpilicueta, incredibly experienced at right back. And Ben Chilwell's not a bad fullback, is he? So, you know, there was talent in that team. And after being sort of made to feel like it was men against boys in Manchester City's favour last week, it was great to see us doing that to someone else, albeit that Chelsea uh, are going through a difficult period. Um, but that goal, it sort of sparked the atmosphere even more into life. It was already good, as I say, but that really took it up another level. And Chelsea just couldn't live with us. And I think it took Arsenal, what, just over uh, just over 10 minutes to get the second goal. And then the third came three minutes after that, and that killed them off completely, didn't it? But the second one, again, Granite Xhaka getting into a similar space, similar position. Chelsea just couldn't live with him. They didn't know what to do. Aspilicueta couldn't live with Trossard and 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 Xhaka sort of doubling up on that side. They couldn't live with Zinchenko coming in field, sometimes going on the outside a little bit yesterday as well. He showed a bit of more variety to his game, I thought. Um, Jesus obviously drifting out there to combine with those players I've mentioned too, made it just so difficult for the Chelsea defenders to live with. And again, Granit Xhaka looks up, knows where Martin Odegaard's going to be. This time it's around about the penalty spot. In comes Odegaard, again, confident, composed, keeps it down and fires into the back of the net to make it two. And then Jesus pops up with the third at the far post. Bit of a mix-up defensively from Chelsea. Not great defending. Granit Xhaka, as I say, involved in the mix again. But Jesus, you know, taking his opportunity when it came his way. A real striker's finish. And I actually thought he deserved the goal um, based on his overall performance because I thought he worked incredibly hard yesterday. I think I tweeted something along, along the lines of, He's a real warrior because I thought yesterday he battled hard. There were times where we went long and there were times where he challenged with Thiago Silva and Wesley Fofana, two centre-halves against whom he doesn't really have a right to win aerial duels, but he was able to win some, if not winning the ball directly. He was able to influence where the second ball dropped because of his sort of work rate and how much of a nuisance he was making himself. So, yeah, I thought it was it was great to see. And at half time, you felt game over. This is exactly what we needed. This is exactly the type of first half performance we wanted to see. And happy days. Let's move on. Let's push on. And um, and uh, you know we we sort of manage the second half and then turn our attention to the big game, obviously up at St James's Park uh, on uh, on Sunday. Just quickly, a word on Odegaard's um, captain's performance. I think it's fair to say that. You step up, you score a couple of big goals for your team when they really, really need it. Um, he pressed from the front. He led by example. And it was nice to see him sort of bounce back because he was heavily criticised, I felt, after the Manchester City game. He was criticised in a couple of the other games as well that we dropped points in prior. But for me, like you're not going to get the best out of every player every single week. And so you need other people to step up and you need other people to sort of take on the mantle. And I thought that, you know, we were very quick or a lot of people were very quick to sort of look at Odegaard and say, well, he's not a leader. He's not a captain, etc., etc." And again, it goes back to what I've always said about him. He's not your traditional captain. He's not the same type of captain that Tony Adams was or that Patrick Vieira was. And so people will question his leadership, but leadership can be leading by example. And I think I've seen a lot from Martin Odegaard this season which suggests that although he's not the most vocal character and he doesn't come across like that in the media and when he gives interviews, he's certainly incredibly intelligent. He's certainly the one who probably understands Mikel Arteta's game model and what's required of that front five, if you like. I can't even do five things. There you go, five. Um, and, and he's the one that ensures that those instructions are carried out. And he's the one that's constantly reminding people around him of what their responsibilities are. So I think he's incredibly important. I think it's, it's a bit like what one of the issues we used to face with Mesut Ozil quite a bit. When people come up against you, they say, well, look, this is their main creative outlet. Let's do everything we can to shut him out of the game. Let's block off the passing lanes to him. Let's get bodies in and around him every time he receives it. Let's be there quickly. Let's press him. Let's hassle him. Teams naturally look at Martin Odegaard as that threat and say, OK, let's try and deal with that. And that can make it difficult for a player sometimes. You know, we talk about elite level attackers We're playing against elite level defenders in the Premier League. It's not always that easy and that simple. But what you need in that instance is other people around you to step up. 
And if you can't impact and influence the game directly with goals, assists, you know, pre-assists, all of that jargon that you hear nowadays, then what you have to do is make sure that you continue to work, make sure that you keep putting a shift in and make sure that you are taking away players from the pool of players that the opponent has to be able to pin on other people. You know, and, and that's what we saw, I think, yesterday. I think Chelsea did a bit of work to try and deal with that space that Odegaard likes to receive the ball in, that sort of right-sided half space. And so what did we do? We, we played down the left a bit more and we used Granit Xhaka, who was just as creative on the night. And then Odegaard was able to vacate the space. He normally finds himself in drifts slightly further in field in search of the opportunities that came his way. And he, he had the technical quality the composure, whatever you like, to finish those chances and put us in a great, great position. I think we've got to talk about Jorginho as well. Um, as I mentioned sort of towards the top of the show, I was worried about Jorginho against this Chelsea side. I wondered if the occasion would have been a problem for him because of his sort of ties to the club. It can, it can be difficult. You know, you can get caught up in the emotions of maybe the reaction from the opposition fans, Easier when it's a home game, granted. You know, it had been easier for Jorginho last night, for example, than it was for, for Aubameyang, who was on away territory. But I, I was so wrong about Jorginho last night because I thought he was incredibly controlling in midfield, even up against some really dynamic players. In possession, he was really responsible. Can't think of a time off the top of my head now, probably wrong, but can't think of a time that he obviously gave the ball away. I thought that he had the right balance between being on hand to intercept things, being on hand to close down spaces, shut doors on this Chelsea side. But also when he had the ball, his first thought was always, can I progress it? Can I play it through the lines? Can I get Arsenal on the attack quicker? Can I do that sooner rather than later? And I think that's really, really important. That's one of the skills that Thomas Partey has brought to the table and has done incredibly well over the course of the season. Last three or four weeks with Partey, it has dropped off. There's no doubt about that. Silly errors. We're seeing um, him losing the ball in key positions. And just to have an alternative option in, um, in uh, what's it called? In uh, Jorginho is massive. It's huge. And um, to be able to trust him in a game like this, look, not the biggest game ever because... People feel like regardless of yesterday's result, we're not going to win the league anyway. But in the context of if Arsenal didn't win it, that would be their season done. I think it did have a, a sort of a lot riding on it. And to be able to bring in trusted players like Jorginho to come in and do a role and do a job, I thought was was something that, you know, we were right to, to make possible by bringing him in. Maybe something that we should have turned to a little bit earlier on. I don't know. It's a hard one because... Partey's form, yeah, as I say, it's dipped, but he's been so good for 90% of the season. You know, it, it would have felt harsh to just sort of take him out and put Jorginho in after one mistake, but after two, three sort of below par performances, then you have to look at what needs changing. And, and Mikel Arteta said that, that he felt that just things needed freshening up. So uh, kudos to him. I thought it was a really, really good performance from Jorginho. Um, does he start at Newcastle? I don't know. As a debate, does he start maybe as well as Partey because of the fact that we're going up to St. James's Park against a Newcastle side that have been really good this season? I don't know. That's another thing to think about and to question. On a negative uh, note from last night, Gabriel uh, picked up an injury which I'm hoping isn't serious. I, I said in my sort of post-match analysis that I felt it was just an impact injury. I felt like he had a few strong challenges, a couple of heavy landings, and that that was what it was all about. That was why he was struggling. But he did go down three or four times. I've read some suggestions on social media that maybe it was a hamstring thing. Mikel Arteta told us in the press conference after that he felt uncomfortable after about 15 or so minutes, which isn't normally the way... Um, you know, Gabriel reacts. He's normally a fighter, Mikel said, and he normally picks himself up, dusts himself off and gets through to the end of the game. He couldn't yesterday. And Mikel Arteta did say that he is a doubt going into the game at St. James's Park. I mean, without Gabriel and Saliba at St. James's Park, I'd fear for us, if I'm honest. 
Um, so I'm, I've got everything crossed that I could possibly cross uh, that he's going to be um, that he's going to be back fit and available uh, ahead of Sunday's big one. So we're top again, and uh, that's kind of all you can do really at this point, isn't it? You know, we're there. Um, Manchester City are in action tonight at the time of recording. I'm hoping that they'll drop points, but I'm not expecting them to drop points. I think I'm going to do what I did on Sunday, which is just avoid their game at all costs. Uh, just check the score at the end. That way you don't have to go through that roller coaster of emotions if they go, uh, you know, uh, if they go a goal behind early, knowing that they could still turn it around. You know, if they if they score after two, three minutes, you don't have to feel that deflation for your entire evening. How about just ignore it as best as you can Put your phone in the kitchen, as I say, and uh, and just, yeah, watch Netflix. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be doing anyway. Um, going to try and avoid it. But look, we've got to be there if City do drop points. And, and that's the important thing now. And we want to end this season on a high, maybe even more importantly than the size of the gap between us and Manchester City points-wise. We just want to finish the season on a high and on a positive because it would just set the mood around the club. And, and make it that bit better going into the summer. I think the mood will be positive anyway because of how far we've come. And I think that that will be reflected in, in probably some of the business and the quality of players that we're able to attract, I hope and I believe. But um, yeah, you want to end the season in as best form as possible. And um, fingers crossed uh, we can do that. Um, not going to do a Q&A on this session because, of course, uh, this one's not live. Um, I've got a mad crazy busy day today uh but i wanted to get this out to you guys as soon as possible i was on the Talksport breakfast show this morning uh with uh, the legend that is laura woods and the legend that is ali mccoist we did five live last night as well as covering the game for bbc london i'm off to cnn uh this afternoon as well uh to do a piece on the arsenal game last night so i've got so much going on and i'm in 90 min's brand spanking new office today uh, for the first time. So I'm on the road. I'm traveling around a little bit today, but I wanted to uh, make sure I got this out to you ASAP. Uh, I do want to tell you, though, uh, who this podcast is sponsored by. I'm going to bring you a quick message from my good friends over at NordVPN. The Chronicles of a Guna podcast is currently brought to you in partnership with the good people over at NordVPN, named one of Times 2022's best inventions. It's the price of a cup of coffee per month and the benefits, I'm sure you'll agree, more than justify the cost. You can protect your data whilst traveling and using public Wi-Fi. NordVPN protects you wherever you are in the world. You can watch sporting events, TV shows, and films that aren't available in your region. So for example, if you log in uh, using a virtual location based in the States and you signed into your Netflix account, uh, you'd be able to access a totally different inventory of stuff, which is fantastic um i like to watch greek football as i keep saying to you guys from time to time i'm not going to say i watch it every week is crap but you know there are things um that do interest me that are in other countries that i want to watch and i can't because they're geoblocked they can't get onto the free streams of these channels because they're geoblocked so what do i do i go on nordvpn and i change my virtual location to greece or to cyprus and i'm able to access that content. You can also purchase flights, subscriptions, and more at cheaper prices uh, by logging in from alternative locations as well. So that's one to keep an eye of. You can grab your exclusive uh, deal with NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com forward slash chronicles AFC. You'd get a huge discount off uh, of your NordVPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And we thank them of course, for their support of the podcast. So there you go. Check out NordVPN. Uh, if you are a member of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast on the Another Slice platform, my player ratings from last night are available to you now as well. Uh, so head over there. Uh, you'll be able to access that bonus piece of content. If you're not a member on the Another Slice platform and you fancy supporting the Chronicles of Aguna, but also the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, then please do uh, go over there, sign up. You'll get bonus content, more of which um, is on its way. And, uh, and yeah, you'll be helping me to continue living the dream, which is 
not having a proper job and basically talking about football every day. Um, and you'll also be supporting a, a really worthwhile cause in the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. So thank you all so much. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. If you're watching us, like, subscribe, you know the drill by now. If you're listening, then please do leave us a review as well. That really, really does help, uh, particularly on Apple Podcasts. And uh, I will see you guys uh, tomorrow. Uh, as far as I know at the moment, yeah, tomorrow is is the next one planned um, to um, discuss whatever is going on in the Arsenal world. We'll also begin, I'm sure, our build up towards that big, big game at St. James's Park on Sunday. Arsenal taking on Newcastle. But for now, enjoy the London Derby victory. Enjoy the next few hours being back at the top of the Premier League because we'll probably be knocked off our perch tonight. And I'll see you all soon. Until next time. Goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.